Invincible. Zooming out of the skies and crashing through into the very teeth of hair-raising peril. A towering hero booming with super action. Sworn enemy of all evil smashing through. His only shield, his super body. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a speeding locomotive. Leaping buildings in a single bound. It's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman. Fighting for truth and justice. See the adventures of Superman. I, I find the concept of Superman fascinating because he's iconic. Superman is, he is, he's America. He's, and he's an American dream of America. And he's an American icon. It's wonderful, you know, the little kiss girl. I find it very, very hard to relate to Superman. I find him probably the most difficult character in comics to relate to, in some ways. But he's great because he's a sun god, you know, and, and point to any of them, Apollo or Dionysus or those parts of the, the, the sun god myth that get incorporated into the Christ legends and so on and so forth, they're all there in Superman, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And that's something that, that I'm looking forward to playing up is, hey, Sun God comics. If Superman is a Sun God, then he's as different from Batman as day from the Dark Knight. Superman steps out of a phone booth. Batman swoops out of a cave. Superman wears red, white, and blue. Batman wears your basic black. Superman is altruistic. Batman wants revenge. Yeah, that's true, Nancy. Dave McKean and Grant Morrison reworked the Batman mythos extensively for their 1989 story, Arkham Asylum. Dave, why did you change Batman's look and his outlook? I just don't believe in a man dressed up as a bat wandering around hitting people. I just don't, I mean, you know, call me old-fashioned, but I just don't believe in that. Um, but there were some things about the character that I did think worked. Um, the fact that he's this dark, blurring, bleak shadow wandering around. You know, you just catch glimpses of him and just flashes down an alleyway. That kind of works. And I like the idea of this image of a, of a man-animal. Because, I mean, there, there have been man birds and man cats and you know man dogs throughout history religious stories and fables and whatever and this just an image of a man bat uh, you know mixed between the two is is kind of interesting the most recent treatments of batman have been saying what would it be like if a man actually wore a bat suit and ran about town beating people up and dave said let's just do it as a symbolic thing rather than as a, a physical person in a suit. And how did, how did that change the myth and the meaning? Well, just every single thing in the book has takes on a, a symbolic value, and all the characters really mean something else. They can be seen as, uh, this could be seen as almost figures from tarot cards, for instance. We've got the tarot cards in the story. They can be seen as uh, personifications of psychological concepts. They can be seen as uh, elements in a recipe for cheesecake, if you want. But, you know, basically everything means something else. So we were able to use these characters in a, a lot of different ways. Thanks, guys. The comic book superheroes share the same powers as the ancient gods, flying fire from their fingers, battling the forces of evil. But the American superheroes don't always translate across cultures. I guess that's why the British comic creators feel compelled to mess with their motivations and imagery. But are there myths that work for all cultures and all countries? While well, I've got the UK line open, let's wire into horror writer extraordinaire, Clive Barker. Well, he can't keep stealing the signal. Uh, Wally, I believe we have the signal back. Hello, and welcome back to Second Nature. I'm Enrico Gruen. Tonight, we're going to look at a researcher who believes... Sorry, lost some power there. I forget the British are on 220 volts. Clive, it's Commander Rick. Is there a collective unconscious of horror, universal myths that frighten all people? Myth? No, I think there are universal images, perhaps. I think there are clearly situations, yes, that uh, uh, would universally be uh, uh, described as, as, as fear-inducing, face-to-face uh, -face with a, ma a madman with a machete. But I, I don't know whether the, really they deserve the term mythological or archetypal. I think... Uh, what we are better looking at is story structures that have a, uh, uh, an inevitability, a terrifying inevitability about them. Uh, you know, the classic nightmare is uh, 
running and running and actually not getting anywhere, and the thing behind you, whatever that thing is, is closing on you. Uh, the image of the skull is, in all cultures, a, uh, uh, a recurring image of, 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 of terror because it's about the eradication of our personality. It's, a, it's about death. It's the, it's, it's the ultimate symbol of death. Um, but I think we have to examine what those images, particularly, for instance, being chased by the monster, actually means, and whether the monster doesn't actually, in, in, uh, in, from personality to personality, represent something different. When this dead hand moves, the monster created by a man they called Mad is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men. <laughs> to shock women into uncontrolled hysteria. Elizabeth! This is the story you've heard about, talked about, the spine-tingling, blood-chilling story that stunned your emotions. Frankenstein. The Frankenstein monster has mythical resonance. In fact, do you know the full title of the novel? No? How about you, Nancy? Yep, right. Prometheus stole the power of fire from heaven as a punishment. He was nailed to a mountain where an eagle tore out his liver every day and it grew back every night. Prometheus inspired Mary Shelley and her story Frankenstein has continued to fire imaginations for 150 years. Why? Who knows? Yeah, true. Bob Hodge is an expert on horror. Bob, it's the commander. Why are so many people drawn to the image of Dr. Frankenstein's monster? People find that very appealing. Uh, kids, apparently, um, at least just responding to the, uh, the image in the old film, the Karloff monster, uh, they respond uh, very strongly to the helplessness and the clumsiness of the creature. Yeah, but then what makes the big guy so universally terrifying? It's an artificial creation, and it comes out of a time when uh, people, Europeans specifically, uh, because it does apply specifically to them, uh, were very fascinated with the idea of artificial creations. Uh, the, the Frankenstein monster was created by the same generation who created clockwork waxworks that moved. Uh, Freud talks about this a little in The Uncanny, about the, pow uh, the power of the doll both to fascinate and to disturb because these creatures are created by humans, but not born. And they are, they resemble human beings. They look human, but are unhuman. Thanks, Bob. We've always had a fascination with humanoid creations, puppets, and of course, robots. Says you. The idea of a human creature who is assembled like Tinker Toys is still popular. The movies Reanimator and Bride of Reanimator. Batman director Tim Burton's first movie was called Frank and Weenie, and then he rebuilt Frankenstein in his latest film, Edward Scissorhands. Frankenstein's monster lives and lives. That's the power of myth. Another mythical monster who has been recycled is Grendel. The original Grendel was the monster from the epic 6th century poem Beowulf. Grendel ravishes the Danish countryside until the brave warrior Beowulf tears off his arm and beats him senseless with the soggy end. Grendel's mommy gets miffed and retrieves the arm, so Beowulf settles the whole thing by beheading them both. <laughs> no, this was back before they had the people's court. Matt, it's Commander Rick. Your comic is not a straight retelling of the Beowulf legend, so why did you use the name Grendel? I was looking for something mythic and archetypical. Uh... And as a result, I dug back to what is the oldest existing uh, English language epic, Beowulf and Grendel. Grendel was um, uh, the monster that Beowulf fought in the uh, early Celtic cycles. Um, I've since read many analyses that compare this to um, the myth that spans all cultures of the initial act of aggression. Uh, it's very similar to Cain and Abel in certain uh, uh, structural uh, situations. Um, I wanted something. I wanted something that would say the devil without saying Satan. Uh, and it seems to work on a lot of levels. People identify with the name, even if they don't know the source. Uh, it strikes certain chords that are buried deep inside us that uh, aren't necessarily conscious. <laughs> 